GTEC, um, a fairly new nonprofit. We are a nonprofit, and um, our mandate is to sort of educate the community on sustainable technologies. So we hold a series of talks, and, and today we're very privileged to have Daniel Rotman of SPEC. SPEC has uh, been around for 50 years. I remember SPEC. This year, as yeah. A kid. Um, the mandate of SPEC is to provide practical solutions for urban sustainability. And SPEC, by the way, stands for the Society Promoting Environmental Conservation. So it too is a nonprofit, charitable, and volunteer driven organization. Are there any Reddit users in the crowd? Hopefully one person, yay, two people. Okay, so Reddit is like a, a message board. Uh, but on Reddit, unlike a lot of social media platforms, there are very strict rules for conversation. You cannot post inflammatory comments. Your, your comment will never even be posted online. Nobody will ever see it. There's a moderator who screens everything. And so people know that if they want to get credits on this message board, if they want to get social, uh, if they want to reach people and have their posts be seen, they have to follow by the rules. Right? So their behavior is guided by things that are happening directly around them. It's the rules of the game that matter more than uh, you trying to play to win. So what I want to do with that in mind is go actually speak to everybody and say what, and I want you to you know, say your name. Uh, tell me if there is a behavior that you'd like to um, that you'd like to work on, or something like that, something that you'd like to change about yourself, uh, and it could be as something as, as easy as I'd like to uh, bring my my reusable mug to work more often, uh, to whatever you feel is is good for you. And then I'm going to take notes, and then what we're going to do is, based on what you guys tell me you'd like to get out of this evening, I'm going to go through the content that I have and address and try and address all of your individual concerns. And we have a small enough crowd that it makes it a little easier to do this. So I hope that you're all willing. If you don't want to, uh, feel, please feel free to uh, pass. Uh, and I would invite you to do that. So around the idea of, of creating context for new behavior, and we'll talk about what context means, and what behavior means, and what behavior change means. So thinking about all these things, what would you like to get out of this evening? And so we can start from here. If you don't mind. I'm Shauna, and um, I did Master of Cycling 2015. Yes, it was the first, first year. Uh, it was great. Um, I guess there's a couple of things when I, I saw this topic, I thought I was really keen on coming. Um, I want to change. I guess it's so overwhelming, the bad news you hear, but, and then when you see people not doing their cycle, right, or you see things. It's very discouraging. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just think that. And that when you, yeah, you have to give up hope. I think that's the thing. Like to keep. Mm. So. Yeah, and then also not to, and sometimes, you know, to rely a lot on convenience sometimes. Like, I mean, that's why, yeah, it's like, oh, you need to get something. Do I need to get it now, right? Like, sometimes mm -hmm. I could get it bulk somewhere, you know, like, so things like that. So, so what I and not rely, like not going into convenience mode. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, like you had to deal with the difficulty also and keep on going and then yeah, yeah not getting sucked into convenience, yeah, right? Yeah. And then you know, like, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got sucked into convenience today. Anybody else get sucked into convenience today? I did. Uh, <laughs> next. Yeah. Hey everyone. My name's Shayla. Um, I think of it as like a lot of things that I think could change. Okay, <laughs> just pick, pick an easy one for me. Pick an easy one then. Uh, about myself and the, and the system, and I think the one that is probably the most relevant, I think that we get out of this talk, is why I like to change why I feel like when I recycle, it's not doing enough. And in comparison to the capitalistic structures and certain corporations that are extracting. Um, resources at such a rate that my, my recycling or my using, not using a bag when picking up produce from the grocery store is even going to make a, a small dent mm -hmm. into, the, into these giant capitalistic structures. Yeah. So I, I like to sort of dissect that, I guess. 
Okay, so just the idea of like, you know, just overwhelming feeling that recycling isn't helping as a, be, you know, yeah, as, a, as a general, as a strategy. No, we're getting that change on the consumer level. Mm -hmm. Right, and the individual behavior versus like system change and stuff like that. Okay. It may not even be what it talks about, but it always... I'll leave it in. It comes up in my mind when we start having these discussions. It's definitely connected. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Okay. We're back, yeah. Hi, my name is Milen. So it's one more time. Milen. Milen, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to build on that, and I think it's a, it's a big one, is how like, you have your, your own kind of personal ethics and the way you want to accomplish, and then you feel that you're like hitting the wall of like a system that isn't growing with you into that goal. Um, and then how do you make that, um, not only giving up, but how do you kind of keep growing into your own hmm. um, Endeavor. I'm talking about like, you know, the things that are waste. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sort of you you hit the wall with your ethics, you kind of run into these places where you have to compromise it, it sounds like it, right? Yeah. Okay. Well you guys are going deep. This is awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next, yeah. Um, hi, my name's Pam. And um, there's, there are many like you said, <laughs> there are many things I I feel like I need to change or um, I'm hoping to change, but one very practical one is um, uh, I'm managing the store in Gaston, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes we just have um, certain homeless people come in, or not, not necessarily homeless people, but you, you know someone coming in that um, you feel tense how to, you know, um, I know I know that I, I want to learn to be open to them. I think with the you know, community, a you moral know, community could change them. Um, however, in the practical side, also, you've got to run your business. Sometimes um, they are there for certain, certain things they want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, in the meantime, how you going to judge, how you can you know, there's a lot of them. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but just, just, just uncomfort, uncomfort Yeah. Discomfort. Yeah. Discomfort. Yeah. Around the staff. Um, or I, I know around that too. Everybody, I believe, everybody want to be a kind person. Mm -hmm. Even someone want to steal something, <laughs> they want to be a kind person most of the time. Right. Um, so just a feeling, you, maybe you, if I gotta reflect that, you sort of feel a little tense around, uh, I don't call it disadvantaged people. Um, and um, you know, there, there's, there's a reputation around with these people that comes along with it and we often react to it, right? And we don't want to, right? But there's a, there's a reaction. So that's actually really good that you brought that up. Um, so we'll talk about, um, so we'll talk about that in a, in a, in a, in a high level way around um, the way we see the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, yeah. excellent. Next. Hi, my name is uh, Dash. Dash. And, uh, yeah, I run a, a community group uh, that promotes plant uh, based lifestyle as an effective climate action. Okay. And uh, as a, it's very personal choice, uh, I want to kind of devise more uh, strategic ways to help people transition mm -hmm. and uh, adopt. Um, so that it's, uh, it's more scalable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's a very specific uh, purpose time here. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi again, Norman. I have a very general, general question, and in a way, it's rather self serious. Um, one of our initiatives at G Tech is that we're developing a software program that is supposed to. Um, engage individual household users um, and, 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 and motivate them to do things that are beneficial to the environment. And um, that is collected. Um, and, and we want to be able to show that in aggregate, that people doing small things on a consistent, sustained basis does make a difference, you know, because I, 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 I understand the, 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 the challenge
challenge, and we all understand the challenge, right? Are we doing enough, and does what we do make any difference? So the question that I have as we're developing the software program is just about human nature. Carrot or the stick? Mm. Okay. As where's, which is the better nudge? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll, I'll sideswipe you when I answer that question, but. <laughs> Thank you very much, Norma, yeah. Hello, my name is Yuki. Uh, I'd like to get rid of uh, negative attitude. Yeah. Trust things, everything. Uh, every time I'm trying to do something new, I think I tend to focus on the negative side of that mm -hmm. instead of the positive side or what I can gain. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's important for me to change. Great, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and Henry and yeah, okay, you too. Yeah. Um, back when I was in development, I was with United Nations and uh, I could be very pessimistic because of the work I did and uh, nothing seems to be working and I just got frustrated. So I found that the government is a problem, the nation is a problem. Because they always tell you, oh, I'm going to do it, you can do a follow up and nothing happens. Yeah. So what's this? I do care about your people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Want you to your country. So I'm uh, experiencing something enough now about climate change, about <laughs> waste. Governments don't seem to be able to, to care. Yeah. They leave it up to the communities, to the individuals. Mm -hmm. so, um, that's about <laughs> being, being a hope and the governments trying to change the attitude of their constituents. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to solve down to the cells in uh, hope <laughs> coming by uh, yeah. soon. <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong. I hope so. But I'd like to be, I'm not pessimistic because I want to be surprised that maybe so many people have been there, I'll joyous forever. Yeah, that's true. I think that type of uh, action has gone up yet. Still waiting. Okay. Thanks, Henry. So I just put too much pressure on individuals. Does that, does that feel like it? That's what you were saying at? Yeah. Too much pressure on individuals? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Eyal, and I'll pick up something that is very different than most people said. I want to change my carb craving. Carb craving? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I change your carpet. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. My name is Tara, and when I think about reduce, reuse, and recycle, I always go to reuse first, and I would like to shift to reduce first. Hmm. Shifting from reuse to reduce. As a first Great. choice. As, yeah. as what comes to me first. Because I find I'll often be like, oh, I'm reusing this. Ah, oh, I could have reduced instead. So yeah. it's like a proactive change right. that I'd like to get to. Okay. Last one. Uh, my name is Sid. Um, I echo the yell. I wish, I wish I could eat better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I wish there were ways to, uh, to get more of the government to agree to do something more quickly uh, to see it as a crisis. Uh, I don't think uh, there's too many people who sort of want to let uh, things evolve and hopefully get better a little bit at a time and hopefully in time. Mm. And I, I wish there were a way to uh, get them to see that more clearly what's going on. Yeah, so take, uh, we need to encourage more fast action. Yeah. Less incrementalism, maybe? Yeah. Wow, okay. Well, for some people, there's not even <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's true. Okay, that was a, that's a really um, 
really great list for me to, to work with. There are a lot of, yeah. So I feel like there's a lot of indication that people feel a lot of pressure on themselves, you know, right? Um, and so this is what I'll start with, right? So I think that when, we, when, we, when I talk about make it easier changing the context around your behavior, um, to, to change your behavior, what we, what we can do is think about kind of the reverse, right? So what is it about our, our contest, co context that actually drives our, our behavior we, we don't like, right? W you know, and I'll, and I'll, if you don't mind, UK, I'll, I'll uh, talk about the way that you think negatively, right? So what is it about the surrounding environment that might be making you, that might be encouraging you to think negatively about everything? Right, so are there, are there uh, I mean, I can think of something, right? So I mean, if you listen to the news a lot, that's almost always bad news, right? <laughs> so do you listen to the news a lot? Yeah. Okay, do you talk about the, ba the events with your friends afterwards and things like that, or is it just kind of reading? Uh, not really, but I uh, can't stop watching the negative news. <laughs> the negative news. Yeah. Uh, I can't stop watching the negative news. Yeah. That discourages me, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Action. Okay, so I think that, I mean, that's, that's something right there, right? So do you think that your watching all of this negative news is contributing to the context of your behavior? Yeah, it might be, yeah. Right? Yeah. OK. So I mean, I, I, like, I'll be honest with you. I stopped watching the news. Like, I can't. There's too much negativity, right? And I know some other people who have, who have done the same thing. You just like stop watching the news. But then you feel like anxious because you don't know what's going on in the world. But, um, I don't know. I've gone. I've gone without watching the news for months. It feels great. <laughs> you you don't miss anything. It's <laughs> it's. <laughs> uh, so another way of like changing the the context around uh, your behavior. I saw. I'll, I'll I'll say AL. Right. So what's what's something about like when do you normally eat carbs? When do I want to eat carbs? No. When you normally eat carbs. Oh. Um when I actually end up eating is very, very little. Yeah. In the morning. Okay. As so you want to cut that very, very little out, but no, it's more, it's more the craving, the, the thought pattern, because for so many years it was my main staple. I'm vegetarian. I probably don't eat enough protein, and I crave or used to crave. A, I still am. A, just. Comfort food, bread and pasta and things, and, right? And uh, it's it's a struggle. Yeah, it's all over the place. It's you see it everywhere. You right hear about it everywhere. So so that's that's the context, right? Yeah. Right. So seeing things, hearing them, experiencing things around you, is what creates the context, right? So um, we'll we'll jump into the we'll jump into this. So when we think about what influences us, um, what, comes, what comes to mind as from the three here? We've got information, right? the raw message that people usually want to communicate. We've got relationships, so how that message is communicated to you oftenly. There's a relationship involved. And then there's rules, the, the structure and incentives that exist around you. Right? So when we talked about context, all of these things combined will always be creating context, right? We're always in relationship with people to some degree. I'm in some sort of small relationship with all of you, and some of you have relationships with each other. Um, I'm delivering information for you. And there is a set of rules that, that I've engaged, right? I'm, I want to do some dialogue with you guys. You are allowed to talk, right? And that's one of the rules. <laughs> uh, and all of those things are going to be having an influence on your behavior, right? You're not shouting out things and, and things like that. So um, when we think about these things, what do you think is having the most impact on you? I think relationships. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And do you wanna do you wanna suggest why? Uh, you know, I, I really I think that 
whether we want to admit it or not, we're very social. Mm -hmm. we, we care about our relationship. We care about what people think about us. Mm -hmm. That, for me, seems to be a motivation. It's, it's like the information is readily available, and it's, it's not about more information, but it's about the relationship. So if someone that I, who I have a strong relationship with or whom, whose opinion I respect says to me, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to be judged, if, if, you, know, you know, by in an adverse or negative way um, for, for, for something. So I think the relationship aspect to me is most important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, that's a really great answer, right? And I think that, so when we're trying to address our behavior, right, what, what do we normally do, right? Or how do we normally convince people to try and change their behavior, right? We talk to them, right? We try and give them information, right? Um, but then something that we might, might not be doing enough of when we deliver information to people is create that relationship, right? So everybody can think about, um, you know, the, the, the difficulty we feel when we, we think that recycling isn't enough, right? Or that we're not, we're not doing isn't, isn't enough. Or when, you know, we constantly just feel like everything that we do isn't working, right? So I would just consider that information, right? But then when you add the layer of relationships, and you say, well, you know, We've been to the Master Recycler program, right? And it is working. There are people who are changing through the Master Recycler program, right? So what this kind of allows you to do is to just refocus things, right? So we get caught up by trying to deal with all the tense going on around us. We're ignoring the relationships. So here's the, here's the tricky thing with, with our brain. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into that now. Actually, first of all, I'll give you, uh, yeah. Actually, let's go jump into the brain. Okay. I'm just sorry. Yeah. Yep. I wanted to ask about the rules. Mm. Because I think oh, yeah. you, how people are commenting on like, the corporations and how they are Because there's sort of the rules of the well, society rules, the rules of a, a corporation that, or even the simple the rules of where you put what or what. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's almost like the, the rules of the corporation aren't jiving with what we, so how you can't, it's sort of difficult to change that, the rules. Yeah, that's true. All right, so the rules have a lot of influence over us as well, especially when the rules are, are rigged. Right? That's, that's something that I think a lot of people tend to feel is that it's, it's actually the rules are, are made in the opposite direction than what we want to be going, right? So I think that what that indicates then is that when we, you know, when we think about certain kinds of behavior, the, the rules really matter, right? And let's just think about some of like for, for something that's really, really uh, recent, just single use items, right? There are no rules against using it, right? So everybody uses it, right? But let's just think about laws as one set of rules. But then let's think about one more thing, just because just I think it's relevant to some of the things that, that some people spoke about, which are your personal rules, right? And how strict do you keep your personal rules, right? Because that will create the sense of a system within, within you, right? And if you keep on breaking your own rules, then maybe you're making yourself into a bad guy, <laughs> right? So a lot of getting over the negativity and a lot of dealing with the difficulty and a lot of running up against those walls all the time requires us to have more compassion. Right? And that's something that's a big part of the Master Recycler program is to become compassionate recyclers and compassionate for yourself. Right? And so I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a good reason now to become uh, compassionate for yourself. <laughs> Do. Okay, let's go back one more. So uh, this is a kind of crude drawing of, of the human brain. Um, and uh, when I ask people sometimes how many brains do we have, 
well, people get confused because they only know we have one brain. Uh, but what this shows is that we have kind of, we, we have kind of three brains, right? Um, and there are three distinct brains uh, in that there's, you know, a, a different driver in front of each of these brains and they're, they're all, like it is kind of like that and it isn't. The way that the brain works in terms of its, its connectivity is very complex and there isn't a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of, of hard and fast rules about how and, and why it works, especially amongst individuals. So our reptile brain, um, which is sort of the most uh, primal that we have within us, and it also some of the similar brain structures exist in snakes and reptiles. And it takes care of our, our most uh, human needs, right? So it takes care of our digestion, our breathing, our heart rate, our fight or flight response. Uh, and if you think about it, like you kind of want that package to be to be running like it is because you don't want you don't want control over your heart rate. You don't want to think about your heart rate. Actually, you want to just breathe. You don't want to be thinking about your breathing. So your reptile brain is largely autonomous of you. It does these things for you, right? It raises your heart rate, and you don't. You don't control that, lowers your heart rate, you don't necessarily control that. Some people can influence their heart rate, you know, through meditation and things like that, practice and training. Then we've got, on top of that, reptile brain, we've got the, the brain of, an, of, of, the, of a mammal, right? And the, the key part of this brain is that's where our emotions sit, and that's where all of our kind of social functions sit. So when you mention that we're very social creatures, it's because we have a brain that is specifically adapted for surviving in social settings, uh, large groups, right? We have a part of our brain, in fact, that keeps track of all of our relationships. And when our brain is just kind of like in not really working on anything, that part of our brain will start to become active. It's called the default mode network. And it's basically a Rolodex of all of your relationships. And you sometimes wander off and you start thinking about things and so this person and that person. And what your brain is doing is going over all of your relationships and figuring out where you stand in the group. Right? What is your status? What's this person's status? And your brain does that completely automatically as well. You find yourself doing it when you're bored and of no volition, you know, it just starts doing it on its own because it's also automatic, that part of your brain. Now, the most advanced part of your brain, the brain of a modern mammal, this includes uh, parts of brains that don't exist in other animals, actually. It exists in other monkeys and, and apes, like uh, primates, like ourselves, so like orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos, are different than monkeys, right? Monkeys have, they're actually missing certain parts of, of brain structures that we have specific ones that are, that are meant for, for human stuff, right? And what do I mean by human stuff? I mean all the things that we do in, in here, this part of our brain. It's like the planning that we do, uh, short-term memory. Uh, in psychology, it's called executive function. It's where we do our planning. Yeah, sorry, I mentioned that our, 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 our planning and, and we, we can bring in between three and five pieces of information into our brain and hold it in our short-term memory and do all sorts of processing on it, right? It allows us to do two things mainly. One, review the past. Figure out, learn from the past, so there's patterns in the past. And then based on that, we can predict the future. This is something that is pretty unique to humans from what we understand, is our ability to take what happened in the past and forecast what might happen in the future based on that. All of that happens in the brain of the modern mammal. So really, I, I, we talked about three brains, but I only want to talk about two brains. The, the conscious brain, right? which is kind of the, the distinctly human one, right? We're not really sure if animals are conscious, but we, we're conscious. I think, therefore, I am, right? And then we've got our unconscious brain that does a lot of our unconscious behavior, right? Differences between these two is our conscious brain is very, very, uh, is very slow, right? It's very intentional. It's deliberate, right? It's also very limited. We cannot keep on thinking all day long. We get tired. We say we get distracted, we, you know, we fall asleep uncontrollably, right? But our unconscious brain, right, the reptile brain and the, the social brain, it deals with all of our emotions, deals with danger detection, it deals with, with habits. It's basically a big option generator, right? Brains just come up with ideas all the time, whether you like it or not, it just, ideas pop up. Right? It's much less limited. 
and it's really, really fast. Right? Think about when you're driving a vehicle, how much information you're taking in and processing, and not only are you driving with one hand, but you're texting at the same time. <laughs> right? So that's, that's the power of your unconscious brain. It's doing all of that for you so that the limited attention you have is actually going to your phone, taking it off the road. Right? Our attention is, you know, there's lots of research on, on how much we can attend. Now there's one really, really important thing with, with our brain, which is once our unconscious, like our, our lizard brain, once we get activated emotionally or we, we sense danger in our environment, whether that's a real threat to us, like somebody coming at us with a knife, or a social threat, somebody attacking our status, somebody disagreeing with us, somebody presenting an idea that challenges one of our core identities, right? What that does, shuts off our brain, right? We lose the ability to have rational thought once we get activated, right? So when a, a disadvantaged person, a homeless person comes into your store and you feel that anxiety coming up and everybody feels that, right? That's not something that you are necessarily in control of, right? You're reacting to something going on around you, and that's your unconscious brain doing that, right? Because what it does is it looks at it in the past, right? What are all of the experiences that we have with people in the street in the past? They tend to be fearful experiences. So when they come into the present, we have something in the future, something bad might happen in the future, right? So that's our brain coming up with these options, right? And it's doing this automatically. Right? It's a habit, right? And we, we get stuck. We, you know, we, we know, you know that they want to be nice people. You want to have a relationship with them, but the part of your brain that deals with that is off. It's just not there. <laughs> right? So when we talk about having compassion for ourselves, right? It's having compassion for our human, our human function. The way we are, our human nature is actually, it's a, it's a flawed machine, right? We get stuck all the time in these loops where we just can't stop thinking about things in a certain way. And the reason that that happens is just like we create habits when we brush our teeth, uh, habits uh, also are used by our brain for everything else that we do. Speech is a, is a habitual behavior, right? And the way that we think about ideas or people or groups of people are also sometimes become habitual, right? So, there's one more influence that I, that I didn't mention before. Uh, and it's the way your brain works, right? Uh, and so what, what, our, what our brain does, if we think about it in terms of our, you know, our conscious brain and our unconscious brain, right? Just think about it in terms of, anybody here learn to play an instrument, right? Play an instrument or play a sport or learn like a skill like sewing or cooking, right? You had to be trained to do that at one point. You had to practice, right? So all I want to say is behavior change is a lot like skill building. It's a lot like that, right? Because it takes a lot of intentional, focused action to learn a new skill, right? And you need to have that focused time, that time where your human brain is on in order for you to practice. And you do that enough times, and what your brain does is it takes the connections that it makes in your, in your conscious brain and then kind of downloads it into your unconscious brain so that you can do it automatically. But what we don't realize is that our brain is doing this all the time for everything and it's been doing it since you were a kid. So your brain will have developed lots of habits and patterns of thought and behaviors that you don't necessarily find valuable, but because you did them for one reason or another while you were, while you were growing up, or even this past year, if you practiced it enough time, it becomes habit, and it goes into your automatic brain. And you stop being in, in so much as control of that, right? So to bring it back around to context, how you train yourself, right? Brain, you, would, you can train yourself is by creating your own context for new behaviors, right? And becoming aware of how the context around you is creating, is, is influencing your current set of behaviors. So, 
let's uh, try and, and practice this now on uh, on some of the things that we want to that we want to work on. So for for plant based for plant based diets, right? Um, the way our brain works, right? So let's think about how many times will a person who consumes meat have consumed meat uh, by the time they get to like say 35? It's a lot. A lot, right? Let's just say like thousands and thousands of times, right? Yeah, hundreds of thousands of times, right? So if you watch the news every day, um, how many times a day are you interacting with something that's negative? A lot, right? Uh, Eyal, how many times do you eat carbs before wanting to stop eat carbs? <laughs> okay, right. So, and and then let's let's bring it up to that level, right? How many times have we been told that it's us that's the problem? It's not the system, right? How many rules are set up to to tell us it's, it's on us? It's not the system. Right? So there's a lot of these influences happening on us right now, and we discredit them because we don't often uh, think about this influence. We think about the other influences. We think about laws and information and, and relationships, right? But, but this, one, this one has kind of like a multiplier effect, right? Which brain does the excuses come from? Excuses? <laughs> 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 That's really good. That's really good. <laughs> excuses are, are can be well practiced for people, right? Sometimes it just excuses come out of people's mouths and they, they don't even notice it, right? It's just we're, we're so we're so well versed in practice at giving excuses, um, right? And also let, let's think about this. Sid, so for you know, how do we encourage more fast action, right? Let's just think about how the government has worked up till this point. A lot of slow incremental actions, occasionally peppered by you know really harsh, direct, firm actions, right? So if we want to think about that, well, let's, we have to go back in, in the past and say, well, what were the contexts around those, those quick, decisive actions? You know, and how can, we, how can we create the context for those quick, decisive actions? Naomi Klein talks about this a lot, actually. Right? In one of her new book, This Changes Everything, she talks about this in a very big way because what she's seen over and over again is that governments create crises, right? they create problems, and then all of a sudden a whole bunch more laws get created and um, uh, policies get created because of that crisis that they sometimes manufacture. Right? So all they do is they create the context in order to drive people's behavior, and then, well, you reacted. Now the government is, is kind of listening to you, right, because of, because of you reacted. But they created that context, right? And we can do that for ourselves as well, right? Let's think about, you know, um, hmm. right, so let's think about reuse to reduce. Right? So how do we create a context right, where you think about reduction more than you do reuse? Right? So what are the things, what's something that you, you wish you reduced and that you reused recently? Mm, I'd say a paper cup. Okay, a paper cup. Okay. So what was the, what was the context? Like a session like this and rushing in and I was thirsty and there was water and there was a paper cup and I grabbed it before I even thought, oh, I have my bottle. Uh -huh. And so then I'm like, oh, I'll just keep that paper <laughs> a couple of times. So you had your bottle on you, but you forgot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting. So there was a context there, right? And the context was the busyness in your mind and you got distracted and then you reached for, reached for the cup, right? So. And it was a Vancouver Zero waste. <laughs> So maybe there was maybe you were nervous also too from being inside that context, right? So this is where things get a little, you know, kind of a, a, a little outside of what we can talk about in this, you know, because it's not really like therapy, right? But yeah, but but we have to think about the context inside our mind, right? Because that's an environment that has that that all these the rules and influences have an effect on, right? 
And the, the reason, the reason I, I, I want to bring that up is, actually, let's, whoa. can I do that? No, let's go back here. So the brain of the modern mammal is where information gets processed, right? We deal with information up there mostly, right? And the why information doesn't work is because, well, when we get activated in our emotional brain, this brain shuts off. So information no longer works, right? The thing I didn't tell you before is that not only can this brain get shut off by being overwhelmed by you know, emotions or the context or the environment, uh, but it also just runs out of steam after a while. Right? We can only really consume enough energy to power that part of our brain so some research suggests about three hours a day, non-consecutive time. Right? But you only have about three hours of focused attention every day. And then once you use up that three hours, you're totally operating in on automatic mode, just that. And maybe you'll get like little bits of attention and clarity every once in a while, but you're, you're just you know, like zombie mode. Right? Can you think of all those times where it's like it's after work and you left work and got home and can't really remember how you got home? Like you drove home, and you're just like, I don't really remember driving home. Has that happened to anybody? Yeah, I'm hearing, I'm seeing some set, some head nods. Or how about like this has happened to me before, where I'll walk into the bathroom and start brushing my teeth, and I'll just be like, wait a minute, why am I brushing my teeth? Okay, maybe that's just me. <laughs> but like how how was your day? You kind of remember your day. Yeah, yeah, something like that. We lose short-term memory too when we get activated, right? So we lose access to some pretty 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 critical things. Um, so. Uh, that's another reason, or I lost my, kind of lost my train of thought there. We, um, right, so we can, we can lose this part of our brain that is required for, for us to, to change our behavior, right? We need this part on in order to change our behavior. And we can lose this if we run out of juice throughout the day or if we get too activated too often. Uh, and, it, and it just affects us, right? It's just this, you know, we, we keep on thinking, hey, why can't I get out of this funk? Or how come, um, how come nothing is, you know, like I keep on having to compromise my, my ethics, you know, and, and recycling just doesn't feel like it's enough? Well, it's because this part of our brain is off. And when this part of our brain is off, we tend to get more emotional about things and we get less rational. But the problem is, is that we don't know that this is off. And so we will feel like we are being rational. We will think that we are operating at 100% capacity, but we're not. So I was talking about this with Norman, is that at some point, we need to be able to sense when this is happening inside our body. We need to be able to sense when we're getting activated, when somebody comes into the store that makes us uncomfortable. Really, hey, this is not me that's doing it's not it's not me that's being uncomfortable it's my it's my lizard brain you know and it's my social brain right so in that sense it's not that there's something wrong with you because that happens it's just the way your brain works <laughs> right and so if we want to create a new context you know we have to think about in a very, you know, sort of intentional way. What is it about the current context that makes me uncomfortable? Right? And can I create a new context that will make it different? Right? And so sometimes it means you need to change things physically. Right? So a lot of people sometimes when they move or when they get new jobs, right? Uh, it's a big shift in your life. It's really, it's really a good opportunity to try other new things because your brain is already kind of scrambled, right? And it's, and it's already taking in new information and being willing to do some changes. And so by adding a few more onto that, you can probably, you can kickstart, uh, you can kickstart more, more behavior changes, right? Um, so in terms of carrot and stick, it's actually neither. Right? <laughs> so uh, what is it? It's just, it's, it's you know, carrot and stick are, are, are a part of context, but um, so is just uh, repeating behavior until it's normal. Right? So you can, you can, because the thing is, is, if you 
keep on giving somebody the stick, right? You create a relationship now where you're the punitive person, and that, that becomes the standard, right? Same thing where somebody, you give somebody a, a, a reward every time they see you, you now create an expectation for that reward, right? So it's less about the carrot and the stick and more about creating that context. And sometimes that means having very intentional relationships with people that are you know, based more on honesty and about what your intentions are rather than achieving a result or some sort of exchange. Now, quite often, a lot of our relationships are based on exchanges, right? As we interact with society. And let's think about how the transactional nature of our society impacts us, right? How much of our interaction is transactional, and so how does that influence other kinds of relationships that we don't want to be transactional? Right? Because our brain doesn't know how to stop doing things once you've created a habit, right? So I want to just like take a breather for a second <laughs> uh, and check in with people and see has something has something sparked something inside you? Is there something that um, like give you an idea on on your particular uh, challenge that you brought with or that you mentioned? Does anybody want to? Yeah. Is there? I'm just wondering if like around the strategies that that one might want to develop to like to say, inspire people who aren't living dreams um, and maybe the reason is because their modern brain just like shut off after we're getting home and then if it's like neither care nor then can you like have a strategy to like recontextualize or, or create that new context that are like maybe more like pleasant or? Yeah, yeah, I mean it usually just involves conversations with people. I mean, un unfortunately that's like, when, when there are very few people in society doing behaviors and your intention is to try and get as many people as you want to do a behavior, it's very, very difficult, right? We can't just force people to do things that they don't want to do. But we can create groups of people that are all doing what we want to do, right? So that's called creating a context, right? So if I and 10 of my friends go out and we're all people that bring our reusable mugs with us, but there's like two or three people in that group who join who aren't the kind of people who always bring their reusable mugs, how do you think that they're going to feel like they're in the minority in that group, right? And that everybody else is doing that, right? So sometimes it means that we need to very intentionally create that context, right, where we stack the odds of, it, uh, of the group around us and bring people in in a slow enough manner so that they always feel like everybody else around them is doing the thing that you want them to do, and they're the only ones who aren't. Because think about it. If everybody around you has the newest iPhone or Samsung, what do you want to do? You want to get that new thing, right? <laughs> so you need to create that context, you know? And, and Apple and Samsung do a great job of creating that context by continuously releasing new things and convincing us that the newest thing is the best thing that there is, right? They create that context intentionally. And so we need to do the same thing, right? So that's something that we do with the, the spec waste committee, right? We think about how do we, how can we do that, right? And, um, quite often that means working in small groups, working with your friends, starting at a much smaller scale and trying to get everybody around you to change all at once. And then quite often it just means we have to go in, in, inside ourselves a little bit too, right? And understand the way that we work might be influencing the way that we try and get other people to work. Right. So when we so when we talk about strategies, right? The number one way to connect with the parts of our brain that are social is to talk about values, right? So these are all like reasons to to stop using disposable coffee cups, uh, and people will connect with different parts of this, right? And when we're speaking to people about wanting to make a change, we need to realize that our values are not other people's values. And that when we're speaking, we're espousing and talking about our own values, right? 
So what it means is we need to look at our own values and understand why they are potentially, uh, why, we're, why we're doing it, right? And our, what are our values? Our values are our, our core ethics, our personal rules, right? That's our internal rule system that we live by. What are the values that are most important to me? And they change, right? So we can come up with uh, all sorts of reasons, right? And some reasons will be better than others for different people. And so in order for us to accurately, you know, um, talk about plant-based diets with people, we need to think about all of the different values that are at play, not just the ones that matter to you, right? But all the values that matter to other people. And then what we, the, the fun part comes when I have, you have this value and I have a value. And what quite often happens is values compete with each other. Right? But the way we get around that is by finding a connection, a connection value, right? So a lot of people, will want to switch um, to, to, to reusable cups for environmental reasons. Let's say, you know, these plastic cups are the scourge of the earth, right? Um, but that's not quite enough for some people, right, who are not environmentally motivated. Uh, but they're like, you know, they talk about taste and flavor a lot, right? And so there's something that connects those two things, which is like, which is purity. Right? People who really love the way food is prepared and, and enjoy the taste, it's the quality and the purity of the food and the way that it's prepared that really matters to them, right? which is what gets that great taste. And for environmentalists, we want to keep the purity of, of our natural environment. We want to keep the purity of our ecosystems to some state that we, you know, we would like it to be at in some natural state or some, some balanced state, right? So the way that somebody who's environmentally motivated can talk to somebody who really cares about the taste of their coffee is by talking about purity. Because purity is a value that can connect both those two things. So it means we need to do a lot of thinking about what are the values at play. And even with yourself, right? You want to make a change and you want to, um, you know, stop eating carbs or <laughs> eat more, eat more, eat more plants. What, you know, what are values that one are encouraging you to do the behavior you don't want to do, and what's another value that you could employ to encourage the behavior you do want to do? So, like, there's probably healthy living, right, as part of not eating carbs. Right? Healthy living is also part of not uh, part of part of changing our our uh, our diet. Um, you know, there is there is a lot of um, comfort in what we call comfort food in this case, but habits that are kind of very very old yeah. that makes us comfortable mm -hmm. and together with the speed of life. And everything needs to be right now and available and easy and quite a bit, not just cups, but coffee cups and the, the plastic bags and many of our big items in sustainability environmental issues right now are about availability. Quick, mm -hmm. easy, simple, and still touch that inner comfort that makes us comfortable. Mm -hmm. Coffee, like sugar, like a warmth. You know, fleece is a very nice and comfortable item. And it's considered to be the outdoorsy, the environmentally right. thing, but it's really not enough to iron it. You don't have to just wash it once in a while. But then it sheds hundreds of thousands of pieces of plastic into the environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you know, it, it when it comes to when you feel that that internal pressure, right? There's a, a it's called cognitive dissonance, right? Is when we hold two ideas that are opposite to each other at the same time, or we hold two values that are important to each other but that are uh, competing at the same time, right? Quite often. 
um, for health reasons, certain things can't be recycled. Right? Quite often for, not for heat reasons, that's a bad example, uh, but for, we'll call this heat reasons, that's more of like a, um, that's like a preference, a personal preference, right, that people have, how hot they drink their coffee, right? Um, and environmentalism isn't really a personal preference. A lot of people feel like called to that, like they have to, to do that, right? There's a, there's a, a drive there, right? How do you connect really personal preference with, with drive? Well, a lot of people make an intentional choice, right? So how do you, you know, how does salmon get upstream, right, and constantly swim upstream to, to lay their eggs? You make that intentional choice. And if you think about your internal state, your internal environment, and your intentions and how important that is, of creating a context in your brain, in your mind, about how the world can work. That's called changing context, right? This is really late at night. And it's just after like. I think it's fairly easier to do it for yourself. Yeah. But to inspire that in other people. Um, you know, especially for environmental reasons, uh, you know, how to create that movement is, I think it's, uh, you brought up like community context before, right? And for me, uh, that's more like a chicken and egg kind of question, because when you start as a minority, you know, mm -hmm. you're really going against the street, right? Uh, how do you, how do you build that context? How do we shape that for other people? Um, and I think drive is definitely one way. Uh, but then a lot of people have that cognitive distance that mm -hmm. you, um, helping them to connect that, I think it's really yeah. quite challenging. Yeah. So, so the way the way I would encourage that is by by the way that I'm doing it right now, right? I taught you something about your brain, right? Um, and in the healthcare profession, and in um, training, and in coaching, there's a certain level of education that's provided in order for people to level up. Right, uh, and why I focus on you know on, on really this this simple thing, right? This is so important because most people don't understand or don't recognize that they're going offline, you know. And when you're offline, all of the best arguments in the world, the most rational reasons to do things, don't work, <laughs> right? And like, and, and we see this happening kind of like in politics, right, where they're using attack ads, and it's all very like emotionally driven because they know that people's rational brains are off and it's way easier to talk to our, our, our monkey brain, right? Our monkey brain gets the better of us, right? And the way that we can, uh, we can't like, we can't change the fact that our monkey brain will, will come out, right? All we can do is recognize when it happens and when it happens, there are certain steps that we can take to mitigate the effects. Right? So for example, you're in a conversation with somebody about plant-based diets and it's just you're hitting that wall with them, right? Uh, what time of day is it? You know, is it at nighttime? Are you really tired? Chances are that part of the brain is off for them and for you, right? So you won't even realize that you're not even being rational and they're just defending themselves because their, their brain is off, they're not receiving information and they're just trying to protect themselves, right? They're, they're receiving a threat, right? Uh, just don't have conversations like that late at night. <laughs> yeah, but, but you have to create the context for that conversation, right? You've got to invite that person out. You have to make sure they're well rested. You have to feed them good food, right? And, and, and build, build that trust with them so that when the information lands, it's going to land on a receptive, receptive human being. Right? And, it, and it just so happens that for a lot of us, most of the time, we're in automatic mode. And we're just not, and, and it's part of it is, part of our, part of it is the, the way our system is set up. There's so much demands on us, right? So to, time is so short, right? And all of that makes us feel more stressed. And all of that shuts down our brain even more, right? So it means that we need to be very, uh, 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 we need to become more skillful at creating environments that pull people out of that 
and bring them into a space that, that, that you think you can have a conversation with them, right? And, and it's quite often very different, right? It's about relationship. It's quite often about finding the best way to relate with that person through connecting values, right? Doing and having that conversation about values. And, and there's a, I don't really have, we don't have time you know, to go into this too much. It's, it's another strategy. It's a whole other conversation, but it's motivational interviewing, right? As you find out what is it that people, what people find their own strength all the time to make changes, right? So if you, if you are talking to somebody about making a large change in their life, you have to find out when was another time that they made a large change in their life, right? And what were the values that they employed? And how did they overcome difficulty in that particular challenge, right? And you get them to talk about all of the ways that they overcome difficulty in the context of this challenge. And then they will be like, oh, well, maybe if I did it there, I could do it here as well. But in order for them to get to that, they have to be like, you know, they just have to be conscious, right? They have to be, be awake. Now, a lot of us are just asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, or the way I look at it many times is monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm. Just keep on doing the same behavior again and again, and slowly more and more people looking at it, more and more people copying it, yeah. and at the end there's the critical mass start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It suddenly become a habit and a, and a norm. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's good that you brought that up because we didn't really talk about social norms, right? So social norms are kind of another way of talking about the informal rules in our society. They're not written rules, but they're more informal rules, right? And they're based off of what the majority of people seem to be doing at the time. Um, and so people can influence that by getting large groups of people together, for example, protests, <laughs> that all share common ideas and, you know, and get them all out and about at the same time, right? And then that makes it seem like to everybody else watching that there are a lot of people who are paying attention to this. And when they see people in that crowd who are like themselves, then that starts to change, change people's minds, right? Um, so we can't necessarily focus on trying to create change in the large mass of majority around us. We need to focus on creating change, firstly, within ourselves and then within our closest relationships. And then you encourage your closest relationships to create that change within themselves, and they go out and do that with their closest relationships. So it is a very slow-moving kind of way, but people pick up on this stuff really quickly. Right? People can adopt new technologies very, very quickly if, it gets that, if we get that, that, right, that right kind of feel. Right? So in order for us to be effective in doing that, I need to be my best self. That's all I can ever try and do, is role model what I would like other people to do and be seen. Actually, I have a comment and, um, and, and a question. Yep. You, you know, this gentleman earlier suggested, and, and I think it's very appropriate, you know, this idea of rationalization. Mm -hmm. that, that as we're in our conscious modern mammalian brain, we, we, we can rationalize, yep. we make excuses, mm -hmm. we can justify anecdotally what I see, whether it be in a person sticking with a fitness regimen or whatever, if there's something that hits their emotion, it, it, mo it, it like, if they're fed up, Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of Greta Thunberg. Yeah. She she was fed up. She was angry. Yeah. And and it's like you and 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 that seems more of the ancient mammalian mind brain than than the higher level. So because you need to activate that right survival instinct, if you will, mm -hmm. that fear of death instinct, in order to facilitate change or something, right. you know? So, so, I mean, I mean the, you bring up a really good point, right? Because yeah. we, we live in the same world. You live in the same world as Greta, right? I live in the same world as Greta. We all live in the same world as Greta, but Greta is really mad, right? Yeah. So what is it about her context then 
that's driving her behavior, right? What is it about the relationships that, that she's had, the information that she's had, the, the constant failure of governments to act, right? It's driving, her to, it's driving her behavior in a very, very large way, right? But she's also being really smart about it, right? And she's creating a context for her message to come across. And she does that through, um, let's just call it her brand, <laughs> right? <laughs> And you know, and she's she's very uh, uh, upfront and you know open about herself, right? Those are the rules of engagement for her. Right? That's how she creates trust with people, um, and that's why her message is is hitting hard with with folks because she's connecting. She's connecting with people because um, she feels it in a very visceral way, in a very visceral way that other people don't, and and that exudes from her, you know. Uh, and the same way that your passion for your way, you know, for 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 your for your for your um, for say veganism, <laughs> yeah, is that the right way of saying it? Your passion for that is what people what will influence people. You'll feel the energy coming from you, right? Uh, and that really matters, right? Because that's also about creating creating that context. Uh, so, uh, and, and we, we are always looking at, okay, so there's, there's social norms, which we talked about, which is kind of the unwritten rules of society. And there's another concept called social proof, right? Which is when we don't know what to do, our social brain is scanning the environment for somebody who looks like or acts like they know what they're doing. <laughs> and then we pick them out and say, oh, I'm gonna do what that person is doing, right? The monkey see, monkey do effect. So we want to be seen when people are looking out for that, right? What do I do in this circumstance? You want to be the person that people see. Now, quite often that, that, might, you, that might mean like you know, stepping out of ourselves to be a little bit more in the public eye, right? Or so we can be seen more. But that's, that's up to you, right? Because like I said before, it's about your own internal context and how you manage that, right? And then about how you use your close relationships to expand on that idea, right? So I, you might just need to talk to one of these guys, <laughs> the guys that come into your store, get to know them all, right? And that will reduce, reduce any kind of potential fear, right? I mean, create a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. The compass, yeah, like that. Inner, inner changes, mm -hmm. first, it comes first. Yeah. And then, yeah, and you can expect um, other people to change first. Exactly, right? Yeah. I, I uh, did like a, a course with my parents recently about parent-child relationships, and what I, you know, uh, got from the course was, uh, you know, stop blaming my parents <laughs> and start focusing on myself, <laughs> because that ends up being a block, right? When you think the issue is outside of you, but the issue is really within you, then you're never going to find the resolution for it out there, right? Because you're looking in the wrong spot. Right, so that's part of why I, I focus on this so much, is because quite often we think we're being conscious when we're not, and we're looking in the wrong spot. <laughs> right, we're just we're acting in the wrong context. Right, we're we're not being attentive to our own values and setting aside the space and time to really consider those things. So I feel like I've, I've talked a lot, and I want to have other people ask questions or talk or comment. <laughs> have we seen all your slides? And yeah, I think so. I think there's, there's maybe, I think there's, this is the last slide. And it's, it's, all, it's all kind of stuff that, that, um, that we've talked about, right? So most of the time, our, our distinctly human brain is not working. You know, if it works for three hours a day and you're, you know, like myself, we're, we're having an evening time meeting, I am not expecting fully aware people. That's fine. And I have compassion for that. <laughs> if you're tired, if it's not making sense, that's cool. You know? Uh, simple and complex behaviors can become habit, right? So we, we talked a little bit about that, right? So a complex behavior would be how we, how we understand our society and how we understand our place in society is a very complex habit, right? That we fit into this society. 
Um, and simple habits are, you know, just like stopping by the Starbucks on the way to work and picking up a coffee rather than making our own in the morning or bringing our, our reusable mug. Behavior change is a function back, which is something I didn't talk about a whole lot, but uh, we did a little bit because um, when you're in relationship with somebody and you're having a dialogue with them, you're constantly getting feedback from them. Right? And when we give the example of learning an instrument or playing a sport and coaching, for example, you're in a relationship with somebody who knows you particularly well and is also able to give you feedback in such a way that allows you to, perf to, to improve on yourself. Right? Uh, and so, I mean, that's one thing that I find critical in my relationship with, with my partner is that we give each other feedback about how we're doing. You know, and the feedback is not uh, seen as something negative or positive. It's not a carrot or a stick. It's very, uh, you know, matter of fact about the state of how you feel in this moment, um, and you and you go from there. Right. So you know, think of like we don't get any feedback on our environmental performance. Right. We don't get any feedback on how many cups we're buying every year or how many times we've eaten meat and the cumulative effects on that. We're not getting any feedback like that. Right? Every once in a while we maybe hear something in the news about how you know, um, Vancouver is recycling 63% or something like that. So we get the feedback of everybody else's behavior combined. Right? We don't get individual feedback. And so if we don't get that feedback, then there's no dialogue happening, there's no relationship happening, there's no growth happening. Yeah. Uh, and I want to mention something about, you mentioned the word values yeah. quite a few times. And I think, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, that the values, the individual values that we have, actually very fluid. I mm -hmm. think that most of us are completely clear about many of our values. Yeah. If we sit in front of each other and ask about it, then we we'll come up with a set of things that actually will make, you know, what we think we should be or what we think is expected from us. Mm -hmm. But when you look at individual behavior, uh, values are more habits. Values are not necessarily conscious ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, they could be, right? So, I mean, this is something that that uh, might be something that everybody in this room, I can give you guys some homework, right? Which is uh, go and, one second. This is the, the list of values that I that I use. This is I think this has about 300, 300 values on it. Wow. Um, and so uh, the way this exercise generally works is you know we've got it's eight twenty five till nine right? Yes. Um, and we'll we'll try and maybe just finish a little bit earlier. So why don't we just take ten minutes? if that's okay with everybody, and we can do a values exercise. Does everybody have like a phone or a piece of paper or a pen or something that they can write with? So what I want everybody to do is to, uh, looking at this list, I'll get it squeezed onto one page. Wow, it's a lot here. So that's the list. So feel free to come up here if you need to. Uh, use a, take, a, take this moment to, to drink some water, have a bathroom break. And then if you're curious, come look at these objects which are on the table here. And then I'll tell you what they are afterwards. I want to actually get some water if you, don't, if you guys don't mind. So this is the list of values. Pick the top uh, 10 and do it relatively quickly. Uh, by the time I come back from uh, from the list, like you should just be going down the list and being like, boom, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, okay, up to 10. So when I come back, everybody will have 10 values. <laughs> Hello. Thanks.
countries that hold, for example, from this list, are necessarily the values that are deep inside you. Could be. But they don't have to be. Not necessarily, no. No. I think that, uh, well, the next part you'll see. I don't know. I mean, so I think everybody has their, has their, has their 10. There's about 15 more seconds. So what I want you to do now is from that 10, um, pick the top five. And I only want you to spend the next two minutes doing it, starting now. <laughs> It should take a lot less than two minutes, but we'll give you two minutes. Thirty more seconds. <coughs> They're so good about their top five, more or less. And now I'm going to ask you for the top two. <laughs> <laughs> seconds. Okay, so with our top two values in mind, I'd like to take a big deep breath. <laughs> Good job. And then I want to show you these things. So uh, did anybody know? Anybody? Anybody guess what this is? If you know what it is, don't say it out loud, but let me guess what it is. <laughs> Anybody know? No? It's a circuit board. Circuit board, yes, right, it is a circuit board. This is a SkyTrain ticket. <laughs> this is a paper, this is inside a SkyTrain ticket. That's how the tap thing works. It's actually a circuit board printed on plastic. Um, <laughs> right? So that's why that's why SkyTrain tickets can't be recycled because um, that's inside it. Uh, and then these ones, I'll just I'll pass them around. So these are are like pressed butterflies 
uh, and they're actually and just pass them around next to each other. Uh, and, and notice the slight difference between the orange one and this one when it comes around, the texture. Yeah. No, no, but similar. So so those are so those are those are made from recycled plastic. So the the orange one is you guys you guys know that construction orange fencing? Yeah. It's made out of that. And those those other butterflies I'm pretty sure are made out of bottle caps. Uh, and so the reason why we can't mix plastics together is because they look like that if we try and recycle all the different kinds of plastic together. Right? So plastic doesn't plastic doesn't mix, right? It's all made out of different materials. Um, yeah, I got these as a as a gift. And this one had a, like a little bit of a of a greasy almost feeling to it, right? Different than this one. Right? And it's because I think there was actually um, this is it had come into contact with something. It's just it's a different kind of plastic, right? So it's a different feel. I felt I felt one of these kinds of butterflies that had been made with um, like plastic plastic bags that were kind of like uh, oily, and then the resulting plastic just felt oily. So the oil didn't disappear in the recycling process. Um, anyway, that was a little bit of a distraction. <laughs> Um, but because I, I wanted to just take your mind off of off of what we're doing for just a second, because I'd like to spend the next just five minutes um, with you and uh, going over what you guys told me sort of in the beginning of like you know what you were feeling, and then while while I'm doing that, I'd like you to take your top two values and think about how you can apply them to what you told me you you kind of. Uh, what, you, what you said at the beginning of the class. So, um, uh, Shoni, you said it was about you know keep on going with the difficulty, and you want to resist convenience. Is there something in your the values that you pick that you think will help you with that? Well, I was thinking more the the one that my first one about the hope part because I mm. think, um, because sometimes I lose hope. That's why I, I just like. <laughs> yeah. They yeah, go, um, go to convenience. So I think the thing is to be um, a little more compassionate. So I, I chose compassion. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and, and actually, the friendship was another top one. Um, but I guess that's what you had addressed to like talking, being around people that feel like minded. Right. Or, or to maybe share those feelings with other people to see like, how they respond. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And create that context for the yeah. compassion, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's that loss of hope that makes it, it just seems so daunting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Shiloh's not here, but um, uh, Milan, is there something about hitting the wall with your, extra, uh, with your ethics or compromising your ethics that one of your values maybe will help you in, in, in doing that? Or in ch challenging, or, or or helping yeah, with that. It's kind of like challenging it, like, and I think I want like my second one is like knowledge. Okay. So I think we need to test it. It's about spreading the word more. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and maybe in kind of like the direct circle that you're talking about. Mm hmm. Cool. All right. Okay. Uh, Pam, is there something that your values that help you feel less tense around uh, disadvantaged people? How we see the see the world? I definitely should because my top one is love. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I think subconsciously, I I just I have to um, keep telling myself love is always within me. Yeah. And um, that's how you. Um, you can influence others with the, your, your good energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, I think probably the practice also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to practice more, less fear, and that hopefully this will deliver a good loving message to mm -hmm. people. And maybe it, maybe it means sometimes it means you know maybe you just need to get something in your immediate environment to remind you of it, right? Uh, 
I can't see it. I have a tattoo on my arm, it's so I don't forget the words on my arm. Uh, the, sometimes it just means bringing something into our environment to help change the environment a little bit to remind us of what's the value that's important to us, right? So maybe you just have to bring something into your store space to remind you of, of this value. That, that too, yeah. 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 We're not short of that, but, but like you said, rules, yeah. rules tells you that you need to do it the other way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think uh, definitely will be, uh, I keep this in mind. Great. Practice on Yeah, awesome. Okay. <laughs> Dash. What about, uh, what about yourself for helping people transition to plant based diets? Yeah, so what's top forward is the passion and growth. Uh, I think passion really um, comes up to building that relationship. Uh, it'll come across as, you know, you have to be passionate about something that you're advocating for, right? Yeah. So that's a good. But um, a growth for me is not just individually, but as a community. Mm. Growth for me is also improvements, right? So I think as we go, we give feedbacks uh, and we also give feedbacks. And I think that's uh, that measure the relationship that you mentioned. Uh, I think that could be um, being, that's a value, I guess. That's yeah. driven. That yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's why you're up. Awesome, excellent, yeah. What about yourself, Norman? Oh, well, lots of <laughs> um, Well, my two values are truth and love. Truth and love. Okay. So how can that? How can we show? How can we use that to show, show people that that small, small, small actions make a big difference? Well, you know, the way, the way I, I, I related to to is that you know in your first slide you talked about information relationship and certainly truth can be characterized as information. Yep. And certainly love is part of uh, relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. there. And, and how it actually. Uh, fits in with my carrot and steak question. It's, okay. It's, you know, I mean, uh, I guess the, the carrot is love, and, and, and the steak could be the truth, because sometimes the truth yeah. is, is hard. Yeah. But it's the truth, it's reality. Mm -hmm. and, so you need a combination of the two. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Go on, Yuki. Is there anything that you, that in your values, to help you deal, be less or less surrounded by negativity, maybe? <laughs> I'm sure that I'll show integrity and happiness. Okay. Uh, because, uh, I, I think integrity is important to be uh, trusted as possible yeah. wherever I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, but also uh, it's important to be happy. And this is just an option choice. Mm. To be happy like any other option. So even even though we are in a, in a problematic situation in, environmentally, yeah. uh, I think we choose a uh, ha happy attitude, positive attitude mm -hmm. to, to make change. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Okay. Henry. Peace and truth. How can we? How do you think we can use that to, uh, yeah, to deal with uh, the pressure on us? Yeah. Anything that hit home with the carb cravings? <laughs> I picked up uh, compassion and resilience. Ah, resilience, nice. And resilience for me is the day to day putting one one step ahead of the other. One less bagel at a time. On, yeah, keep on <laughs> working on what needs to be worked on. It could be carbs, it could be environment, it could be yeah. anything else. It's like just put your head down and keep on working. Mm -hmm. Don't don't necessarily look at everybody else to give you the, the give you what you need or uh, just yeah. just keep on working on what's really important. Yeah, I think I think resiliency is a practice, right? And resiliency, like. Um, 
uh, just something short that, that re it reminded me of how um, you can train yourself to become more resilient by giving yourself little problems to solve. And the more you solve these little problems, how, the more often you solve these little problems, the next time a, a larger or a medium-sized problem comes around, it doesn't seem to be as bad because you've had that practice of solving these problems all the time. And that's part of resiliency. Resiliency for me, a lot of it is commitment. Mm. Stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta stay alive. With Greta, she wants to just stay alive, right? Uh, okay, Tara, yeah. You wanted to shift from, shifting from reuse to uh, reduce. Was there anything about your values that touched that? Yes. I chose zeal and reliability. Hmm. And I would think what I remembered is when you said be compassionate, compassionate to yourself. Yeah. I would see that when all of a sudden, I'm like, why? Why do I have this item in my hand when I didn't mean to use it? Hmm. Uh, I would say I'm not reliable. Okay. And then to remember to be compassionate to myself. Okay. Because next time. I'm not I'm always reliable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually I am. Exactly. I know all about that. Okay. I have a 12 year old son. Okay, yeah. Who I believe is very obvious when part of his brain turns off. Mm. I can just see that. So I'll, I'll be more compassionate towards him also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet you're Evolved brain is off right now. Yeah, let's just take a step back and stare at the wall for a moment. <laughs> uh, and sometimes, I mean, just uh, it brings me back to my own relationship with my partner and how we've, in order to not get caught up in things, we have rules. And sometimes when we see each other in that state, we have a rule where it's, you stop engaging. It's just that's it. You know, the other person is off. Just stop engaging. It's the best. And just start again later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, Sid. Less. Uh, how can we get more fast action, less incrementalism? Is there something about your your values that you pick that can well, can help you towards I'm that? Can, I'm sure I didn't go through this uh, in, in detail, but you took it for logic and preparedness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, of course, logic isn't. Uh, Affecting a lot of people, they, you know, they're acting on their monkey brain as opposed to their yeah. modern mammal brain. They're ignoring the uh, well, as Greta says, ignoring the science. Mm -hmm. right? She says, "Don't listen to me. Listen to the scientists." Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure how. Uh, I mean, to be prepared with the arguments, you have to have someone who's willing to listen. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of people in power who are not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. They already know, <laughs> know how things are. Yeah. And uh, what, what you're telling them doesn't make any difference. Right. They're smarter than <laughs> Okay. I'm not sure. I don't yeah. know. All right. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's Just true things. Think about it, that's all. I mean, these things, I think with, with values, um, like Al mentioned, is they tend to be fluid, right? And um, we quite often, sometimes unconsciously, will pick up different sets of values from different groups or different sets of values from different contexts, right? So quite often at work, sometimes we have different set of values than we do for our personal life or work that we do for ourselves, right? Values and employing values and talking about values is probably the most important strategy in creating context. Right? Because it's something that you can do, have a sit down with somebody and do intentionally and go through that process of what's important to me. Because at some point when you run into the wall or you get fed up or it's just not working anymore, you say, well, okay, what's important to me? What are my values? And go back to that internal context, that internal state where you can be at peace with yourself right, and with your values. And if you find that per perhaps there's a situation that's calling for uh, uh, more from you, well, then maybe there's, a, there's a, another value that you need to bring into the equation then to help you get through that. Or find that connecting value with that other person so that you both can move forward together based on this new shared value. 
And that's bringing us to almost the end. So I want to thank all of you for coming and engaging with me and with the values and thinking about these difficult topics so late at night. I think you all did wonderful. And so give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I wanted to just express uh, great appreciation and thanks for a wonderful, engaging, insightful, and enlightening talk. Uh, thank you for coming out. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to our technician, our person of all things, Michelle over there. Hi, Michelle. And I want to thank the Kitsilano Neighborhood Hub for allowing us the space to do this and that. And just a quick reminder to also thank all of you for making it out here. We do have other talks. We do have a town hall, a very exciting town hall on Monday, November the 18th, just across the way, where it'll be very interactive. We're going to have a, a, a panel of people. We're going to have uh, environmental activists. Uh, Speaking of, and, and, and the whole idea is to seek engagement, to seek some answers, some solutions, some thoughts, some feelings. You know, we're, we're really about trying to build, just like SPEC, trying to build a ground up kind of a, um, engagement. Because, because I think that working at the community level, working at, you know, is what is needed. Um, to facilitate change. And if we do this all together, I think we can get, make things happen. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all for coming out. Mm -hmm. We'll see you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you.